Impact Research Group and Bournemouth University and the Center for Socially Sustainable Consumption. And um, we had already a couple of speakers in the past months, so we're looking at um, discussing and uh, talking uh, about alternatives to the current modes of production and consumption. So we had already some examples and we opened actually with a more like theoretical um, background and researching alternatives. And then we had speakers talking about different cases um, in, um, in this sense. So I'll just leave the word to you, Francesca. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Roberta, and, and thank you, um, Alice. I mean, we are the three organizers of, of these um, um, seminars. Um, and I'm very pleased today to introduce Lara Monticelli, um, who is um, a friend, a very good friend of mine. And uh, um, I'm very happy um, um, that we, we are able even to discuss uh, uh, a little bit her new um, new book, edited book, uh, this this evening. Lara is assistant professor and uh, Marie Curie fellow at the Department of Management, Politics and uh, Philosophy at the Copenhagen Business School. Prior to this, um, Lara worked as postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, in Italy. Um, She's, um, she has a, a very interesting ongoing project uh, that she titled Eco Labs, Eco Villages as Laboratories of Sustainability and Social Changes, um, fo um, focusing on, on the re-emerging of community-based prefigurative social movement, uh, such as uh, um, sustainable community, eco-villages, transition town, solidar solidarity networks, uh, as um, she considers a living laboratory for experimenting with practices of resilience and uh, resistance to environmental, economic, and social challenges. Um, Lara is doing uh, also many other projects, and she's involved in uh, a lot of uh, different uh, research initiatives. Um, she's a very good networking and also a very good uh, um, uh, person to establish a new network. And um, many of us uh, here in this meeting have met, thanks to, to Lara, um, that the, she um, established after a series of conferences that she organized, uh, they were actually called uh, mini conferences uh, that she organized within the Society for Advancement of Social Economics, the SASE. She established um, a very interesting network called Alternatives to Capitalism, where all, most of us are uh, active participants in this, uh, in this network. Um, since 2021, uh, she is the co-editor together with uh, Thurston Gehen, um, um, that, who is working at the University of Copenhagen, of the book series Alternative to Capitalism in the 21st Centuries, uh, published by Bristol University um, Press. And it's with this uh, publisher that um, um, Lara has, is about to publish um, this interesting, uh, um, very interesting uh, uh, co-edited book um, called titled The Future is Now, an introduction to pre prefigurative politics that I guess Lara will uh, pass through on, uh, or touch uh, a little bit in her talk uh, uh, of today. Um, uh, that is entitled Researching Alternative Futures, uh, Taking Stock and Moving Forward. So I think that this is a perfect title to conclude at least the, this first series of seminar for our uh, socio-ecological transition um, idea, I mean. And, um, and um, then I will uh, uh, also present, but after um, um, Lara's talk, uh, our discussion. Um, who is already also a very interesting uh, scholar, but I will um, tell a little bit uh, about him uh, later after uh, to introduce him uh, before, uh, after Lara's talk. Thank you, Lara. The floor is yours. Very welcome to this evening seminar. Thank you very much, uh, sir. First of all, thank you so much, Francesca, Alice, and Roberta, for having invited me and for having organized this. Um, wonderful series of, of events. Um, I'll start if you don't mind sharing my uh, my screen. Uh, let's see if it works. 
Okay. Yeah, can, can you see it? Okay. So, um, Francesca has already wonderful introduced myself. So, um, introduce me. So, thank you so much for that. Uh, um, indeed, I'm, I'm calling you today from, from Copenhagen, from a rainy Copenhagen. Um, and since I have the pleasure of being the uh, last presenter for this uh, cycle of seminars, I decided to divide my presentation in two parts. Um, the first part, it's more a, we could call it meta reflection on uh, what it means to be researching alternative future uh, and alternatives to capitalism. So it's really more of a, uh, of a, of a kind of really uh, taking stock, right? And looking back at what has been done in the last years and what, where is the scholarship now? And then in the second part, instead, I will focus more precisely on um, the editor volume that is forthcoming in September and on the concept of uh, prefigurative politics and prefiguration, which is um, definitely an important concept um, when it comes to the research in um, alternative futures. So, and also I have to say a little disclaimer, probably some of you have heard these things already. Um, so I'm sorry if I'll repeat myself a little bit, especially in this first part. Um, so probably um, many of us as sociologists uh, have realized how um, the financial crisis of 2008-2009 has kind of marked uh, uh, a watershed moment uh, within social movements, civil society initiative, but in general when it comes to um, the public debate, because it, it was exactly in that moment where um, the interest towards uh, capitalism and alternatives to capitalism came back to the fore. And here I'm just I collated some, um, some you know, um, titles from some definitely mainstream um, journals and newspapers, and also I put some books here that really became prominent and important. Just to say that in the last 10 years, um, the idea that capitalism is unsustainable and needs to be um, at least reformed or uh, when it comes to the more radical positions to be transcended towards a more just and sustainable system has become really, uh, we could say, accepted, um, not only, again, in among scholarship, uh, in sociological scholarship, but also within the public debate. Um, let's just think about one example, uh, the recent, I think the last um, World Economic Forum at Davos, launched a new agenda called the Reset, the Great Reset Agenda, um, in which exactly this economist and Klaus Schwab, which is this business guru, he claims explicitly that we need to uh, rethink and reimagine capitalism. Uh, so this is probably in itself um, an interesting observation. Uh, but of course, when it comes to uh, alternative futures and alternatives to capitalism, uh, which type and whose post-capitalist society are we imagining here? Well, again, in the, in the last year, we've seen a really lot of books that are trying to sketch different futures and they're very different among themselves. So we have um, techno-utopianism where, of course, technology is seen as some kind of solution even to, for example, the climatic crisis. And we can see how important it is, even now in discussions around the, uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, some um, thinkers, some experts, and some scientists, they really think that there are, that technology will definitely help us in uh, tackling climate change. Uh, then we have other visions that are completely different, like eco-communalism, I'm citing here Mori Bookchin, which is an, was an anarchist thinker uh, who really um, envisioned a future based on buyer regionalism and localized uh, communities. Then again, to, going back to technology, we also have more kind of radical left-wing visions like the one of the accelerationists where we have a future where technology is being democratized and thus it allows people to be freed from work 
and to uh, and, and so it becomes kind of an emancipatory tool. And all of these visions, of course, here, here I'm just putting three examples, but we have many, many more visions of the future that have been sketched in the last years. Um, all of them, they have their own kind of um, putting in potentials, but also pitfalls, and all of them, they're all problematic in and of themselves. Um, so what happens is that together with these visions for the future, we have observed, uh, I mean, we as sociologists have observed also a flourishing of interpretive frameworks. And by interpretive frameworks, of course, I mean uh, a variety of concepts, frames, um, ways of portraying um, the present, but also kind of the, the future, an alternative future. And all these uh, here are just listed some examples. Of course, it's not even a very updated list. But what we can see is that, first of all, all of these scholars, they kind of refer to each other. They know, to, they know each other, they know each other's scholarship. And they're using some common terminology. And most of all, they're also using some common case studies. It is very, in fact, in fact it's not uncommon to find um, for instance, um, Andrea De Angelis talking about the commons and referring to certain examples in Latin America that are exactly the same examples that are used by, for instance, Federico de Maria and others when they talked about degrowth, right? So it's almost as if there are different concepts, different lenses through which uh, certain sociological phenomena are being observed. And this phenomena definitely uh, boomed and mushroomed a lot. Again, we could take, of course, as a simplification, as some kind of watershed moment, 2008 and 2009, right? So it has been by now more than, of course, uh, more than 10 years. Um, and on top of this, and here's kind of the meta <laughs> self-reflection part, um, is that, of course, there's been an emergence of uh, a research community, right? Many of us are part of it. Um, in fact, um, and here is just more, again, a reflection of what has been happening in the last years. Uh, of course, um, together, also with Francesca and other colleagues, we've organized these mini conferences. And then the, the, the response from the academic community was so uh, big and, and relevant that in 2018, we decided, together with my colleague Torsten Gielan, to establish uh, a permanent research network called Alternatives um, to Capitalism. And, and this is, I think, interesting in itself. So we think that this is kind of a really a new field of research that is taking shape within sociological research. Um, on top of that, uh, more recently in 2021, we also established a new book series with Bristol University Press, which has um, the goal of acting as a platform for this type of publication for research that is published on a series of topics. And here, I just wanted to list you, to list you some of them. So of course, the analysis of capitalism, its crisis and alternative. Then we have topics like deep ecology, ecofeminism, ecosocialism, and degrowth. We have also decolonial and feminist perspective, obviously. All the debate around um, cooperatives, right? Which can be worker, producer, consumer, or hybrid types of cooperatives. Um, democratic socialism and socialism in the 21st century. But then also uh, all the strand that critiques green capitalism and conscious capitalism, right? So kind of the greenwashing uh, debate, right? We have also all the alternative and complementary currencies and we have in fact in our series, uh, a forthcoming book uh, exactly on um, alternative currencies. We have another book on the commons, which is forthcoming. Uh, we have a book which is actually about to come out also in October by Professor Frank Kadloff in Hamburg on um, the convivial society, so on conviviality and the society of the gift. Um, and here, of course, also on the right hand side, we um, together with Torsten, we try to put together uh, an advisory board that is reflecting this variety of themes, right? So we have 
of course, Francesca is part of it as well. But we really try to bring together people that are reflecting the, um, this variety and richness of different perspectives. So this is to say that maybe whether in 2015, 2016, when uh, together with Francesca and Paolo Graziano and Thurston, we organized our first mini conference in Berkeley, we felt like we were taking a big risk. We didn't know where people would respond to this. And maybe we even felt a bit lonely, right, in conducing this type of research. My feeling is that by now, there is a more established community around these themes, and many of these themes are becoming more and more accepted within um, even mainstream academia, mainstream journals. Um, we also have a mailing list, which uh, has approximately 500 members, and all of you, you're welcome to join it if you want. Afterwards, I can share the details. But also what is important is that, is that um, our network alternatives to capitalism is also very much linked to other, uh, to other realities, other networks that do research or are activists when it comes to alternatives. And just to mention some of them, we have the Dutch Research Institute for Transition, which is, I think, um, a very special research center because it does research on transitions, which is usually very, um, we could say, dry. But it, it's really, I think they do it in a way that is really um, focusing on radical transitions and on emancipatory transitions. So looking very much on bottom up grassroots um, community based initiatives. Then we have, for instance, the European Network for Community Led Initiatives that again, EU funded type of organization. And then last but not least, we have uh, a network of networks, which is the global tapestry of alternatives, of which uh, our SASE network is an endorser. And the global tapestry of alternative is something really, really interesting because it is a platform for community-based social movements, but also, it really, I think, bridges very nicely the academic, the academic community with the activist community. And the Global Tapestry of Alternative is also participating to um, the World Social Forum, which is taking place these days or just finished. It's, it's going to the various conference on the climate. And it's really acting as a network, as a pedagogical platform, an academic research-based platform. So it's really interesting that um, I really suggest you to have a look at their uh, website. Mm. And also, not, um, um, uh, also importantly, it is very much focused on, on, a, on the decolonial aspect of alternatives to capitalism. And it provides a platform for a lot of these communities that, that are based in uh, the global south. Okay, so if this is where we are now, um, the question that I would like to, um, to pose right now is what does it mean imply to imagine alternatives to capitalism or, and this is something that I've added recently, alternative capitalisms? Because I also realized by reading at the literature that not all alternatives are really alternatives to capitalism, but many alternatives are also forms of capitalism that is more green, more sustainable, more just. So I think that we always should keep in mind that when talking about alternatives, we have a wide range of, of them, right? Ranging from more radical one to more reformist and even to conservative type of alternatives. So it's not always correct, I think, to speak about alternatives to capitalism. And so here, um, just as a heuristic device, right, to help us kind of clarify um, some aspects, I'm using uh, classic Eric Collingbride's um, typology uh, that I've taken from his uh, posthumous book, um, How to be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century. And in this little booklet, he uh, kind of uses the very nice metaphor, metaphor of capitalism as a game, let's say as a soccer game, where you can change different things at different levels. And so first he says, well, 
what we can do is decide that we don't want to play the game anymore. We want to change game. We want to play volleyball now. And it says, okay, so we call this topology smashing capitalism. Or we might decide that we want to stick to the game, but we want to change some functioning role. And he calls these different these strategies taming and dismantling. And I'll get there in a moment. And then the third level on which we can bring uh, change is even more, we could call it conservative. So it's like sticking to the same game, but changing the type of moves in the game. Let's say that sticking to the metaphor of soccer, we can now touch the ball with our hands. And he calls these different, these two um, typologies that are under changing, changing the movement in the game, resisting capitalism and escaping capitalism. And I'll get that in a, in a moment to explain also what are the differences. And in fact, the other dimension of this typology is not the level of the system, but is the objective of the struggle. So what do we really want to do? We want to neutralize the harms provoked by capitalism, or we want to transcend and move to totally different types of socioeconomic systems, right? So when it comes to neutralizing harms, he says, okay, we can either tame capitalism, which is reforming capitalism through the state. So basically putting limits to the type of damage that can be done by capitalism. And we can think about an example here, um, creating limits for emissions of CO2 or creating uh, like we have uh, a market for certificates of emissions of CO2 or creating, for instance, regulation that can protect the rights of the workers or the rights of the environment. But also resisting uh, capitalism, which means calling out for injustices and claiming that something is not right and needs to be changed. When it comes instead to transcending, well, of course, uh, changing the game, right, seems very easy, easier said than done. But it says that switching, actually, from capitalism to a totally different system, it's quite difficult, unrealistic, and can even be dangerous. And of course, Eric Olin Wright refers to the effects and the kind of ex experiment of the um, Sovietic Union, right, of the real uh, socialism. Then when it comes to another type of mode of transcending capitalism, he said, well, we can dismantle it. And here he brings a very interesting example of, for instance, public ownership, right? So capitalism has this tendency of privatizing and marketizing everything. And this can really be counterbalanced and um, dismantled by opposing and reclaiming, for instance, private ownership on some fundamental um, goods on some fundamental structures that shouldn't be marketized. So an example of this kind of mixed economy when the private still exists, but is counterbalanced by the very strong uh, public um, sphere. Uh, in sense, I mean, the state, of course, it's uh, important. So a counterbalancing. Um, and finally, the escaping capitalism. With the escaping, well, he says, well, we can decide that we don't want to play that game anymore, but we, we want to instead um, change the rules without really walking away, which is the smashing. And here we have a lot of interesting um, examples, among which the intentional communities, the eco-villages, who are still, and we will see it in a moment, within capitalism very much. You're still embedded in capitalism, but are trying, not without difficulty, to embody different practices, different values, different ways of living. So as you've probably noticed and realized, these different strategies, they're not alternative to each other, right? Because if we look outside as sociologists, we can see that different uh, movement, civil movements, civil society initiative, even state initiative, if we think about the Green, the Green New Deal, we have um, all of them. We can see all of them in our society. And in fact, Eric Collin Wright says that, in fact, all of them, what they're doing 
they are eroding capitalism. And here we can imagine like a little drop of water that slowly, almost in a car sick movement, erodes a mountain, right? So he says, we don't need to choose between one or the other. The most effective strategy to reach alternatives, to embody, to implement alternatives and eventually switch to a different socioeconomic system is act enacting all of them. Okay, so here is just like a general, which I think is a useful, uh, at least to me, heuristic device to, to help us how to think about alternatives. And I was, I saw that in their literature, Eric Collingwright is really becoming a, um, a point of reference because I think he tried um, not without difficulty or, or criticism or weaknesses to create a simplified way of thinking uh, about alternatives. But here then I want to pass to uh, my second part of my presentation which is focusing on prefigurative politics. So in the last um, years, I've been working quite a lot on, on this aspect. And I think that uh, prefigurative politics, it doesn't appear in Eric Colin Wright typology, but it could in a way be seen as linked to kind of the escaping um, strategy. Because what we're talking about is um, types of the, of change, types of initiatives that are interstitial. And what Eric Colin Wright means by interstitial is that they develop some of the cracks of um, capitalism. So where there are little um, spaces left uh, from marketization, from privatization, from neoliberalization, and there are lots of um, movements or initiatives that emerge, emerge in these cracks and they can eventually develop or create networks. An example is of course the cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, or the eco-village movement, intentional community movement. And again, if we look at this movement and their development in the last 10, 15 years, we've seen, we can see that there has been an increase in this initiative in almost all parts of the world. And I'm not sure, but I would bet on the fact that probably the, um, the pandemic has also given a, a push to more solidarity initiatives um, of this type. So what are we really talking about when we talk about prefigurative politics? Um, if we look at different phenomena, I've tried in, in, in a paper published in 2018 to uh, find some common aspects that can uh, unify all these different initiatives. So first of all, they are really local, place-based, but at the same time, they are transnationally interconnected in networks. Like the Global Ecovillage Network, for instance, is an example, which is, is a big umbrella, a big organization that unifies all the ecovillages in Europe, but also uh, all over the world. Then they connect both on the urban and the rural space. Um, they are very much practice-based, and they, and, and then we will talk about it in a moment, their focus on the doing rather than the claiming. The moment of protest is less um, present, less important when it comes to the repertoire of action of these movements. And then they emphasize also the importance of working on multiple levels, on the environmental, the social, the economic, the cultural level. And for instance, in the eco-village movement, um, on the website of, of GEN, Global Eco-Village Network, uh, we can find this definition, which is very interesting, of holistic sustainability. And again, um, what I've observed is that whether talking about holistic sustainability four or five years ago, it was very strange, unusual, and awkward. Uh, with the launch of the sustainability development strategy, the sustainability development goals of the UN, and all the more recent debates around climate change and how to tackle it, Talking about holistic sustainability is indeed becoming much more uh, common. If we think also about, and I'm sure that Stefania Barca 
has talked about it during our presentation, the fact that we cannot achieve climatic justice without social justice. And all these aspects are deeply intertwined. Um, I think a very interesting strand of scholarship that really um, does interesting research on, 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 on holistic sustainability is all the scholarship on word ecology. And here I'm thinking about Jason Moore, for instance, Rai Patel, and all these uh, historians, really, that are researching um, the, the climate crisis from a social, economic, and historical perspective. But again, going back to our prefigurative movement. So, like I said, um, prefigure, the prefigurative movement, they go beyond resistance. Uh, I'm not saying that they're not resisting, but what they're doing is much more. They are um, focusing on production, alternative forms of production, consumption, but also different forms of social reproduction. And here is just a simplification, again, that I've used in my paper, but I realized by kind of doing a, a, a little survey on, on these movements that they tend either to defend spaces from capitalist appropriation and accumulation. And we can think here about, for instance, the Zona de Fondre in France, which is this occupied area, which is um, occupied and defended from becoming an airport. We have examples where these prefigurative movements are trying to restore and reappropriate spaces of former capitalist production. Of course, very common examples here are the um, reconverted uh, factories. And finally, some prefigurative initiatives are trying to create ex novo new places of alternative production and reproduction, for example, intentional communities. Um, at the same time, and here I'm borrowing from uh, radical geography, really, uh, these movements have three characteristics that we can find at the same time. So not only they're anti-capitalist uh, and post-capitalist in the sense that they envision already and they embody alternative futures. But interestingly, and here we go again talking about this very interesting topic of, of the border, right, between what is alternative and what is it not, that these movements are despite capitalists. They exist despite the fact of being embedded in capitalism. And I've been looking at a very interesting example of Oroville, this intentional community uh, with, um, with a colleague who lives there, actually. And we realized how interesting it is to look at what happens at the border in this kind of gray zone between the in of the community, the inside of the community, and the outside of the community. And there's some very interesting phenomena that happen exactly at that border, we could say. Um, and then another interesting aspect. So if we have this prefigurative movements, right? How do we make sense of them? How do we relate this to the existing scholarship in, within social movement studies? Well, an interesting um, source of inspiration, and, and we talked with, uh, with Francesca about it as well, comes from Alberto Melucci, because Alberto Melucci in his book, Challenging Codes, published in 1996, was probably one of the first scholars within social movements, maybe not mainstream social movement scholarship, to talk about movement that announce what is about to take shape. And if we look at more recent scholarship on prefigurative movement, that movement, that's exactly what we are finding. Um, here it, it's a quote uh, by Emily Brissett, which says that it's an action as creation that lies at the heart of prefigurative politics which seeks to actualize in the present a vision of collective futures, forward-looking, yet resolutely present, prefigurative politics, um, sorry, I can't see, prefigurative politics activate imagination while reconfiguring lived social relations. And I think this is very important because the aspect of social reproduction, I think it's really important within um, prefigurative movements, right? They're not only focused on, 
on consumption or production. But there's really an aspect of um, embodiment and how can we make sure that this alternative is embodied and reproduced over time. So now uh, more kind of the closing part of my presentation. Uh, when I started to research uh, prefigurative politics, um, the moment in which I started, it kind of corresponded with uh, the moment in which we launched the research network alternatives to capitalism. And so there was this community of scholars that were talking and sharing and all of us, we, I think we thought that the concept of prefigurative politics could be uh, very uh, fruitful and productive to apply to our different case studies. So what happened is that already many years ago, and this book took many years uh, to see the light, um, I started with this idea of um, curating an edited volume that could offer to uh, young and, and more senior scholars a good introduction to uh, the topic, right? And back then, actually, the idea was really original. I just was not foreseeing that in the following years, the scholarship on prefigurative politics would have exploded and boomed. Uh, so actually the book now is coming in September, 2022 with Bristol University Press. And maybe, you know, there is already like a lot being written on prefigurative politics, but I still hope that this will be a useful um, compendium. And so it's really a collective endeavor. And we can see here in the table of content, uh, we have a lot of contributions a forward by Arturo Escobar, a scholar, of course, of um, post-development, who coined also the term the pluriverse. And then we have really a lot of chapters who I try to uh, divide and organize in three thematic sections. The first one is called Contextualizing Prefigurative Politics, and it includes, as you can see, uh, kind of big big themes, big ideas that are fundamental to understand when it comes to prefiguration. And then the second section is more applied. So we have a lot of chapters um, on examples of prefiguration. So prefiguration when it comes to work, prefiguration when it comes to intentional communities and eco-villages, prefiguration when it comes to ecotopia movements, uh, when it comes to uh, even armed uh, movements like the Rojava um, matristic uh, revolution. Um, and all of them, I think this, they, they really um, offer a nice overview on the, on the different fields where we can see uh, prefiguration in action, we could say. And then the final and closing part of the book is a um, reflection on what are the challenges and the difficulties and the potentials of doing research by deploying this concept. Because um, like all we could say emerging fields, which suddenly become very fashionable, um, also prefigurative politics doesn't fall short of uh, having uh, problems and of having to be used with a grain of salt and some caution. And in fact, um, the book finishes, I think, with a very useful chapter, which is a polemic, which is a critique towards uh, prefigurative uh, research. So what are the main messages from this book that I want to share with you today? Uh, I found this quote from Arturo Escobar in the foreword uh, very beautiful and useful, so I decided to just copy and paste it here. And he says that, um, that we humans have forgotten how to act properly as living beings on the planet, from which it follows that humanity's greatest task is to relearn how to be non-destructive, not exploitative, and being relational beings. This means that prefiguration has an ontological dimension. It is about creating alternative words, other ways of being, knowing, and doing. This book is part of a planetary movement of mobilizing for a new way of dwelling on the earth. 
And, and I think that probably if I had to decide on what is the main takeaway message from the entire edited volume is that prefigurative politics has a unique onto-epistemic dimension. So not only it creates alternative worlds, but also it has a deep epistemological dimension, a pedagogical dimension, we can say, because like Arturo Escobar is saying, by engaging in prefigurative initiatives and prefigurative movement, may they be very small, very niche, or maybe even very kind of volatile in time. Um, I think the, 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 the humans involved, the people involved in this type of initiative, they learn, they experience a different way, another way of being. Um, and I think that this is probably a very useful way of thinking about prefiguration. Another characteristic, and here again, the word holistic appears again, is that really change is sought on many, many different layers, not only economy, politics, environment, but I would dare to say, even if it might raise some eyebrows, even on the spiritual level, really, a, uh, on the value level, right? Um, the time in which prefigurative politics envisages change is the present, is imminent. We need to embody change here and now. And then here we have again, like I said before, what are the interstitial spaces? So they can be existing spaces, new spaces, or restored spaces. And then another, um, and here I know that I'm simplifying a lot, but I just was trying to give you some points of reflection on from the book. Uh, what distinguishes prefigurative politics from other types of politics, like for instance, representative politics and contentious politics, is definitely the mechanism of change, the relationship to power, especially state power, and the temporality. And here you can see, again, in a sim very simplified way, that the mechanism of change of prefigurative politics is different. It's based on an erosion, on an embodiment of, of something alternative. The relationship with state power is usually, and I want to underline usually because it's not always the case, avoiding state power. These movements are not um, focused on seizing state power, right? They're rather focused on avoiding it or sometimes collaborating it if there is need. Um, but uh, they definitely don't have a conflictual relationship with state power. And again, then, like I said, when it comes to temporality, it's a process. It is a, it's a process. When I went to visit the biggest intentional communities in the world, which is Orville, um, they have this definition of, uh, they use it a lot, of karma yoga, which is change through doing, which is never finished really. The project of Orville will never be finished. They're always constructing something. They're always implementing a new initiative, shutting down another one. It's, it's constant, it's constant. So, here I want to provoke you with a question. Uh, so can utopia be seen as an emancipatory strategy? Well, my reply to this, and it would be very interesting to know your thoughts, is yes, but it shouldn't be thought as a, as a unique strategy for emancipation, right? So when, just going back to this, I really think that a lot of the criticism that is made towards uh, prefigurative politics come from the fact that people think that <laughs> scholars or activists engaging in this type of initiatives think that they can bring change, even change at a bigger scale, only through those types of initiatives. But I think that instead we should think as prefigurative politics as a necessary um, addition to other types of politics, representative politics, contentious politics, right? We shouldn't think about different types of politics as alternative to each other, uh, as one excluding each other, but I really do think that prefigurative politics has something to give, as something to teach us exactly because of its own epistemological um, feature. 
Um, and here just I wanted to briefly mention, so, okay, let's say we have an alternative, we have a prefigurative initiative. How does it resist, rightly because it's embedded in capitalism, so it's always either uh, pushed to being destroyed or being co-opted. And this is a, a recent paper that I published with um, a, a colleague, an anthropologist, uh, who has been studied for many, many years, um, the intentional community of Orville. And in this article, I, we come forth with the definition of flexible institutionalization. What is it? Well, we, we studied two examples taken from Orville. One is the political decision-making structure. And the second is um, basically a production consumption cooperative of food that has been existing in Orville for 50 years now, more than 50 years. So without going too much into details, we think that there is a way for these prefigurative movements to resist over time, to reproduce over time. And this um, entails a very difficult balance between the outside world and the prefigurative embodied initiative, which is not always easy and, so, and it's very fragile. Um, and also the other characteristics we, we, of, of um, a prefigurative initiative to be resistant and resilient over time is that of being constantly subject to negotiation, to change, to modification, exactly because there are different generations that um, are involved in these initiatives, there are the different contexts, different even socio-political situations. For instance, when it comes to Orville relationship with the Indian government, well, it has been a peaceful relationship in the last 50 years, but in the last year, there have been growing conflicts because of the um, kind of right-wing conservative agenda of Narendra Modi and his attempts to um, interfere more and more in the decisional processes of Orville, right? Um, so yeah, flexible institutionalization could be a useful lens, but it's really a tentative, right, um, definition mm, through which to maybe study initiatives that are prefigurative and resistant over time, and they even maybe are able to um, bring change at at higher level rather than only the internal uh, level. But just on this, I just want to add something that um, when you study, you researcher study prefigurative initiatives and politics, the question that you will almost certainly be asked in any presentation, this is at least my experience, is, oh yeah, this is all beautiful and very nice, but how do you scale up how do you make sure that these initiatives are scaled? So my answer, and I think now I've, I've, I've kind of tried it many, many times, is that prefigurative initiatives, they're not startups. They're not uh, capitalist startups of which goal is to grow up and become attractive enough to be bought by a venture capitalist or by a big, uh, a bigger corporation. The, the, the nature, the feature of prefigurative initiative is that to embody an alternative and to act as an example, to act as a best practice. But I'm not sure whether the scaling up, the growth, should be seen as a feature of these movements. And maybe Francesca, you can add on this because I know that you've been working a lot on different ways of conceptualizing scaling, right? But I know that many thinkers like Ashish Kotari, Arturo Escobar, they would agree with me on this, that the scaling thing, uh, the scaling issue we could call it, it's a, a problematic one and delicate. Um, and here, so to close, I hope to have uh, titillated your intellectual curiosity, but I wanted to close by um, posing some questions 
to you <laughs> rather than maybe receiving them, of course. Um, because also this is uh, what I think what Francesca, Isha, and Roberta are trying to create is a community, is a platform for people doing research on similar topics. And so my interest would be to hear more about whether, how do we envision the future of our research? How do we make sure that we create fruitful and constructive networks and collaborations between us? Because I think we need to harness the fact that we are here and that we know each other and that we are always the same faces, more or less, that we see at certain uh, seminars. And, and finally, in what ways can we adapt and update our teaching, our curricula, in order to include um, teaching on alternatives? So these are really questions that I would like um, to, to discuss uh, with you. So thank you very much. I have no idea how much time I took, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lara. Uh, just uh, I wanted to change it this way. Um, thank you very much, Lara. Um, I think we we probably all uh, have appreciated very much your talk, and because you draw us um, into your itinerary of research, and I think that. Uh, um, we can see, at least I could notice a lot of consistency, uh, but also how you built your argument uh, step by step. I mean, I follow your work for more than 10 years. So, and I also, I, um, I think that the presentation of your book, um, I mean, is, I can I can, uh, I, can um, I can say that it's much more than an edited book, what Lara um, has produced, because she really, put a lot of care <laughs> and uh, care work on it. Um, so I, I really think that it will be a, a very interesting uh, reading. Um, although it is true, as you say, that there has been a lot of um, writing and, uh, and articles uh, on configuration in the, in the time, during the time span that you have were editing this book. But I think that is a good example about how academic work should be. Uh, taking time, discussing with authors, uh, trying to help them to improve and also to, to merge and uh, to, to find out uh, um, a, a, an argument, um, a common argument uh, um, linking the different chapters. So, um, and this is why um, we wanted to, I mean, we, we tried and uh, luckily he accepted uh, to invite as uh, Lara's discussant, uh, Bern uh, Benford, um, who is uh, now a research as associate uh, at the Wales Institute of Social and Economic Research and Data. Uh, Bern um, has also um, worked on, on more or less the same um, topics than, uh, than La Lara. He's uh, especially interested in social and solidarity economy but he is also working on mobilization and strategy of progressive social movements uh, um, in alternative modes of economic and social reproduction. Um, and uh, on the top of this, uh, um, he has already uh, read um, Lara's uh, edited book as um, she accepted a, a few months ago to write the first, I guess, uh, review that is um, uh, about to be published in a, a female uh, journal. And, um, and before going uh, uh, and try uh, together to answer uh, the question, the provocative question, because I think that uh, we are all going around this uh, and try to act around the question you posed to us. Um, I, give, I will give the floor to, to Bern for, for opening the, the discussion of, uh, of to this evening. Thank you, Bern, again, to be um, here uh, with us. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Francesca. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, seminar. I'm yeah, really looking forward uh, to the discussion. Um, and uh, first of all, huge congratulations to Lara for uh, this phenomenal volume, really. It was was a pleasure to read and uh, I'm yeah, grateful for this opportunity to, to discuss it. Um, yeah, uh, maybe to start with uh, a, a little bit more in terms of my work, like I'm specifically in the 
this this uh, position looking at uh, community-based food networks. And previously, I've looked at transnational collaboration in the anti-austerity movement. So basically, where I'm coming from is kind of looking at um, how how prefigurative movements can can sort of organize and collaborate uh, actually at scale to a certain extent. Um, which may be an interesting contrast to what uh, Lara now uh, said towards the end. Um, so I also think uh, prefiguration in general has become a really important uh, uh, aspect of social movements in general. Uh, over the past 10, 20 years, I think there's almost no progressive movements at the very least that don't have at least some extent of um, horizontal horizontal democracy or try to create alternative social spaces, reject institutional collaboration to some extent, try to pursue commons-based economic alternatives. Um, I think it is very ubiquitous in that sense, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that prefigurative politics has become uh, like perfectly well understood or, or perfectly mastered in practice. It is, it is indeed something that can be conceptualized very differently, that can be studied very differently that can be practiced very differently. So in that sense, there's a wide range of practices, there's a wide range of challenges involved. And that's why I think this, this book and this research that, that Lara is doing is so important. Um, uh, about the book, uh, Lara described it as an introduction to prefigurative politics. I think it is much more than that because honestly, it, provi it provides a really wide wealth of theoretical and empirical insights, which I think can offer inspiration to like any scholar and activist, regardless of seniority and familiarity with the topic. Um, and what I find most striking about it, besides all of its contributions, is that it has this, what I would call unapologetically activist approach to scholarship, which I, I really like. It's um, it's really something to see that the authors do not present themselves as sort of artificially detached from the movements they're discussing. They, uh, uh, they, they very much sympathize with the movements, but at the very uh, same time, they don't, they don't embellish the movement's achievements or shy away from, from discussing their shortcomings. So in that sense, the, the book is also practically instructive to some extent, besides being uh, inspirational, I think. Um, now for the discussion, I would like to focus on three different themes that um, that the book covers to varying degrees and that I think are um, yeah very curious to get into, especially as researchers of prefigurative politics. Um, the first one is exactly this topic of the the scalarity of of prefigurative politics, uh, which I would discuss as the transscalar nature of it. Uh, and it may sound like I'm disagreeing with Lara here, but I think I'm. In, in a way, I'm just adding to what she's saying and sort of maybe viewing it from a from a slightly different perspective. Because as Lara said, prefigurative movements are locally rooted and, but at the same time sort of transnational or what I would call transscalar. So it means they, they do not seek to scale up vertically by becoming larger organizations or by um, becoming embedded within the state for the most part. Instead, what they're doing is they, they become diffused uh, across decentralized horizontal networks, diffused across territories, across sectors. They build alternative economic infrastructures. They try to create new forms of participation, create, uh, try to create new, um, new, new norms and values. Um, the book doesn't really use these terms, but you could say that they do not scale up, they scale out and they scale deep. Um, the way one chapter by Mikola Manen describes it is that, um, that prefigurative movements operate via emergent orders, um, which means they're informal, they're bottom up, they're affinity based, um, as opposed to being uh, sort of formally organized and top down and authoritative. Uh, and the question I would ask to this, though, is um, how is this done in practice? And, and especially how is this done across these horizontal networks? Because to me, at least, this idea of emergent orders, it seems to sort of imply that prefigurative movements, they expand more or less spontaneously as new local initiatives get founded. And they all sort of, if they get together, they do so organically and automatically. And I think I, I would slightly challenge that notion, honestly, um, because there's also uh, a well-known risk of what has been called defensive localism, where 
certain uh, uh, alternative projects tend to only focus on a specific area, only focus on their particular members, and don't necessarily engage with the wider system uh, or systemic struggles. Um, and I think one of the chapters in the book about uh, Christiania in Denmark actually really shows this, because Christiania is, a, is an intentional community that is, um, that is literally fenced off from its neighbors and that does not really engage with other social movements in the area. Um, but at the same time, even prefigurative uh, uh, projects that do want to collaborate with other movements or, or with each other, uh, they still have to do so by uh, uh, pursuing deliberate strategies to do so. They still need to put in effort. They need to invest time and capacities. They need to actually build network infrastructures to collaborate with one another. Um, and because every prefigurative project, every intentional community, operates at least slightly differently, uh, I would say we cannot assume that their goals and practices will just align automatically without effort. Um, Anna Dinerstein explains that uh, prefigurative projects, when they try to engage with the state, they need to translate their practices. And I think to a lesser extent, they need to do the same also when they collaborate with one another. Um, at the very least, um, I think what we need to look at is how, how, it, uh, how it is possible for these types of uh, uh, projects to, to organize networks in a way that they can um, that they can reconcile structural differences, political differences, tactical differences, uh, and especially also how they navigate resource and power imbalances, especially those born out of capitalist and colonial inequalities. Um, and there are many fascinating examples to look into. Uh, the book itself, um, uh, it mentions uh, La Via Campesina and transition towns, which are international networks that I believe were founded like 20 plus years ago, and they have done a fantastic job of actually connecting different prefigurative projects and, and other movements across the globe uh, around shared visions of building self-reliant economies and of, of facilitating uh, food sovereignty. Uh, but as Laura said, after this major financial crisis in 2008, we have seen uh, the growth of large new networks of the solidarity economy, especially in Southern Europe. We have seen um, yeah, we have seen these networks bringing together mutual aid initiatives, commons projects in a way where they do actually collaborate with one another at scale in a way. Um, they also collaborate with one another internationally in the REPES network, which actually tries to advocate for prefigurative uh, politics at the level of in international institutions. There's also the Fearless Cities network, which um, which connects uh, radical municipalist projects. Uh, so in that sense, there are many cases of, of prefiguration operating across scales. And I think uh, if we want to ask to what extent prefigurative movements can contribute to alternative futures, I think we need to examine this and at the very least ask um, what capacity they have, if not for growth, then at least for diffusion, at least for consolidation and to view that as a deliberate social movement strategy and, and investigate it in those terms. Now, um, the second theme um, I wanted to discuss is um, the question of prefigurative politics on the right, um, which is not something I myself look into, but it's kind of the closest thing that some of the book's authors come to disagreeing with each other and to actually having like a contentious debate uh, between uh, chapters, because Many of them do criticize that much of the literature does not really look at this as a topic and sort of implicitly assumes that prefiguration is leftist in nature. Um, I think Mikola Manen uh, argues this as well and says that, uh, first of all, progressive scholars should be normatively obligated in a way to not equate left and right wing politics and actually consider right wing prefiguration as something substantively different and actually call it something different. Uh, and here's where I would actually disagree with that and say that um, that not only do right-wing movements absolutely engage in prefiguration, I would say they, their practices aren't even necessarily substantively different uh, from the left in certain cases. Um, because right-leaning activists, at the very least, were certainly part of the square occupation movement in Greece. They, they were certainly part of the um, five-star movement in Italy, which I don't think I need to tell you. Um, and uh, in fact, I would say prefigurative politics can actually be sort of a strategic field that different political movements can struggle over. Um, 
the German community supported agriculture movement, which is something that I look into, they actually have a major problem with this because their whole strategy of building these local food commons, that's something that really appeals to far right actors too, especially like prepper types or far right communitarians who, who want to build their own traditionalist and ethno racist enclaves. And in that sense, there, uh, yeah, they, this this movement really needs to has to struggle against far right co optation. So, in that sense, I would say it is entirely possible for left and right actors to use the same prefigurative uh, uh, practices to essentially prefigure their own utopian spaces, whatever they consider under that. Um, and yeah, just in general, I think um, I, I I find it understandable to say that. Uh, uh, that we should prefer, or that I myself also certainly prefer studying progressive movements, but I don't think we can assume that the left has an exclusive hold on really any sort of strategy. I think we, we need to keep an open mind about this, this sort of thing, um, also from a tactical perspective. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the last thing I, I wanted to discuss is prefiguration in research and academia which um, as Lara explained, especially the, the later chapters go into a lot of detail discussing the challenges of, of what it means to study prefiguration. Um, and they do make this case for having a more engaged and activist approach to research. Uh, and then obviously, uh, Lara herself also writes about this where she says, uh, I think in the introductory chapter that, um, that researchers should not use like standard analyses of prefigurative movements, but actually uh, ask how effective these movements are and what can be done to enhance their effectiveness in a way. Um, and I think especially the second aspect implicitly also asks what we as researchers can do to contribute to, to the success of these movements. Um, and many of the book's authors obviously do that and, and discuss these things, highlight good practices, uh, uh, encourage conceptual and strategic reflection. Um, and I really like the books afterward in that regard because uh, Davina Cooper actually takes us a step further almost and says almost, yeah, introspectively in a way, uh, asks how researchers can engage in prefigurative politics within academia itself, which I think is an incredibly important question in that regard. Um, in her case, she discusses this along the lines of, for instance, using alternative currencies in universities or, um, or applying more experimental designs, prototyping policies, prototyping community projects within our research itself. Um, which I think are all fascinating examples. And I think that sort of thing deserves deeper reflection because there's a long history of, of intersections between academia and prefiguration um, from the 1960s student movements onwards, who I think through their prefigurative activism actually changed a lot about how the university works. And I think that sort of thing is, is something we need to keep in mind. And I mean, even today, we have a lot of collaboration between um, between researchers and activists, especially around themes of climate crisis. And there's there's a lot of knowledge sharing, but there's also a lot of collective raising awareness and, and mobilization to a certain extent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we could also critically examine that uh, many practices that were once alternative have become institutionally accepted, at least within social sciences. Um, things like open access publishing, things like co-production with practitioners, those things, are a normal part of, of research applications at this point and almost sort of expected. Um, so in that sense, we should, I think, question to, to what extent prefiguration has become internalized in academia and really ask ourselves to what extent it's positive, to what extent we can consider it a, a form of co-optation. And then based on that, also reflect on what other opportunities there are to further push for new transformative uh, uh, prefigurative uh, practices within our own work. Uh, maybe as just a few examples, there are colleagues of mine who also work on food uh, movements who run what they call stable schools, where they uh, create these collaborative spaces together with sustainable farmers. Uh, and they don't just co-produce publications or knowledge, but they actually collectively organize uh, agricultural skill training that actually directly helps the, the actors themselves. Uh, another colleague of mine who lectures on alternative uh, economics 
what she does is she asks her students to come up with essentially feasible non-capitalist enterprises. And she, she actually encourages them to try to launch them after they're done with their studies. So um, yeah, the, those sort of examples I find really fascinating. And I'd love to hear yeah, more examples from you if you, if you know others. And uh, yeah, with that, I'm finished with my discussion. And uh, like I said, congratulations on this phenomenal volume. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this discussion and, and, and more. Thanks. Thank you, Bern, and also thank you, Lara. I haven't done to yet. Um, the discussion, I think, has been very, very rich, and uh, so many themes are there on uh, on the table. Uh, so, just ask whether there are questions from the audience. Um, you can post them in the chat, or uh, you can just uh, raise your hand and go ahead if uh, if you have. One. And Alicia, if you want, in the meantime, I can uh, comment on burn. Uh, how, how do you want to proceed? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mention. Uh, it was just because it's a, a quarter past six, so I am a little bit aware of time. So I just wanted to know whether there was uh, um, any question in the audience. And But if, uh, if there are no questions and uh, maybe people want just to, uh, a little bit of time to uh, think about all of these, uh, these new ideas and interesting uh, reflections, please you. Lara, uh, I think you can go ahead and uh, and give a quick reply. Thanks. Yeah. So first of all, uh, thank you, Bern, for this wonderful commentary on the book. I think it's a wonderful um, and insightful and precise comment. So first of all, thank you so much for having even had the patience of going through it. Really, thank you. Um, and yeah, it was a very long, uh, a very long endeavor, um, uh, and also that resisted a lot of difficulties in terms of my personal life and in general the COVID, the pandemic, and and everything. So, seeing it almost now ready, it's um, it's really uh, nice for me. It's really beautiful. Um, so I would like maybe before we go to the other uh, questions, um, I would like to maybe say something on the first point, uh, the one of scalarity. And while you were talking and kind of describing right the the differences between um, and the, and the kind of contradictions and paradoxes within these perfigurative movements. Um, and, and their sometimes effort to scale out and scale deep. And you were talking about the emergent order that Nico is um, talking about and writing about in this chapter. I had, um, I don't know, I, ref I had kind of a, a sudden idea that I just would like to share. Um, could it make sense to think that prefigurative movements have their, let's say, because they're so involved and engaged in actually reproducing the alternatives into the day by day, uh, which requires an enormous amount of energy, time, and resources, right? Uh, they don't have, let's say, time and energy in excess to think about the outside or to think about growing and scaling um, up or out. But sometimes, like you say, Bern, I think that is true, that there are kind of, we could call them, I'm improvising here, meso organizations or umbrella organizations that do their job for them. And I'm thinking about RIPIS, like you just mentioned, or the Global Ecovillage Network. What these organizations are doing, they are weaving together localized initiatives and trying to act almost as lobbyist for them. Um, and this is at least what I'm seeing with the Global Eco Village Network, maybe Repis is doing that also. And if I look at the global tapestry of alternatives, this is exactly what they're doing. They are, uh, some of the people involved, of course, in the GTA are also involved in the grassroots, hands-on, 
movement. But most of the others um, are uh, advocates of these movements. They are almost helping them to self-reflect, to uh, create networks, to speak with other, uh, both horizontally and vertically, with other organizations, right? And for instance, the Global Eco Village Network is invited at the various um, conference on the climate, uh, the World Social Forum, at the European Union, which is something that if we think about a single eco village in the Tuscan countryside, I mean, they just wouldn't have the capacity, the time, the energy, and probably not even the willingness to do these kind of things. So maybe there is kind of a meso level that helps for figurative initiatives to make sense of themselves and to be understood and to even impact the outside world, we could say. So this is just a reflection that really came to my mind now. I'm not sure if it makes sense, but maybe it could be something that we could um, think about and reflect on uh, even together, um, for instance, in a collaboration. And, and then um, on the point of definitely prefiguration on the right, but regressive prefiguration for sure. And in fact, I know that uh, Emil and um, Eric, together with other colleagues based here in Copenhagen in Denmark are um, curating a special issue on the kind of prepping movement, uh, people who, like you said, are preparing for the apocalypse. And, um, and these people are not necessarily people that belong to kind of a left-wing political position. I think that the COVID pandemic um, also blurred even further the discourse and the positioning of, uh, in general, social movements, not only prefigurative initiatives, so that we have uh, radical left-wingers who became no-vaxxers and kind of they sympathize with conspiracy theories, which are paradoxically positions that are very similar to uh, radical outright positions, right? So um, uh, there is definitely a blurring when it comes to, like you say, um, certain prefigurative practices, certain solidaristic practices that started with the Great Recession, but now I think also they've, they had like a new push with the, with the COVID pandemic. Um, and third point, yes, I agree with you that Davina Cooper's contribution in the afterward is really useful and insightful. And um, she comes from um, the experience of the um, radical municipalism in the UK in the 70s. And I think that she's still um, having, like you say, this kind of activist research approach to her work. And, and yeah, I, I think you're right in thinking that, um, is it, does it make sense to think about prefigurative practices within academia? And how can we uh, how can we implement them? And it, this is personally a reflection that with my co-organizer of the SASA network we are having all the time. Um, when uh, a conference costs 400, 500 years to attend, are we really being prefigurative in what we do? And this is something that we're trying to uh, to tackle and to to deal with maybe in the future, you know, to to be also more coherent, right, uh, with um, to what we study and how we we do it. So thank you very for this fantastic um, feedback. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So um, there are a few questions from the audience. Marta asks, um, would you say prefigurative politics are an escaping strategy? I am not sure this was implied or not. And, if, and she wants to join the mailing list and wants to know how and Roberta as well. Then Roberta also has uh, some other questions. So um, after, I don't know whether you want to want me to pick up Roberta's questions as well and then reply is that okay okay so roberta if you want to ask your questions oh, thank you alicia 
Uh, thank you so much, Lara. I'm so like impressed with all the work you've done, and I was like, extremely interesting. I have so many questions. I don't know where to start. I'm just gonna ask you the questions that you choose, or maybe to um, have a brief uh, reply, and then I I really hope we will find ways to continue these discussions because there is a lot of overlap also with what uh, of my themes of research and the way that I approach research. I really, really liked what uh, Bern said about being your book being uh, unapologetically activist. I think that is like a really wonderful way of conducting research and I, I hope I will align uh, to this as well. Um, so my first question was a bit um, clarificatory, more about a clarification. So at some point you presented um, a figure where um, prefigurative initiatives were categorized into anti-capitalist and then despite capitalist and then post-capitalist. And I was just wondering whether for, for the way the figure was constructed, it seems that all these initiatives are anti-capitalists and then within that, some are despite capitalists and within that uh, post-capitalist. So I was just wondering whether there is space for initiatives that are not directly anti-capitalist in the sense that they are alternative capitalisms, as you said at the beginning, or uh, initiatives that do not define themselves in opposition to capitalism. So they are still not playing the role of the game, but they are uh, moving beyond. And uh, and I always think at uh, Gibson Graham, um, the verse economists, when they say that they're actually they, um, it's important to also look at these initiatives that do not define um, their identity in opposition to capitalists, because that is where really the imagination and the creativity comes forward. Uh, and uh, they talk about these radical ontological possibilities of redefining something that is not opposed to capital. So I was just wondering whether the, what would you position these initiatives in your uh, matrix? And I have other two questions, which I will ask you anyway, but probably you won't have to answer, so I apologize, but I'm just so, so into this topic. My second question was about uh, the role of digital activism. So whether you think that this is, um, you, you asked to the audience at some point, what are the themes that you think we should be looking at? And I think that the digital spaces are really a great space to look at. You emphasize the importance of space and defending, creating and restoring spaces. And I think digital spaces is one of the dimensions that are really uh, important probably for the future. Um, I apologize. <laughs> and my last question was about, um, um, so we talked a lot also with Bernd about pref um, prefiguration in academia. And we mentioned many practices and I would really love to hear more about them, but they were all, all, also um, uh, all about research. So we talked about open accesses, conferences, co-creation. So I was just wondering, what about teaching? Is that, do we have examples there? Is there something maybe in your collection uh, or that you could point us to? I would really love to hear more about how we can uh, bring uh, prefiguration into teaching. I will stop, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I think uh, I will give the word to Lara and then also Baron if he wants to reply. Thanks. So we have three minutes, so I try to be super quick. Um, uh, escapism, yes, some of them. Some of them that can definitely be, uh, and they've been criticized for being escapist, like intentional communities, for, for instance. Then um, when it comes to um, to the question, to Roberta's <clears throat> question about the diverse economy and the figure, you know, actually, you're right. I think that perhaps I should rethink. Uh, I borrowed the, the definition from a paper written by these radical geographers. And it's true that it's not that not of all prefigurative initiative are at least explicitly anti anti capitalist for sure, despite capitalist because they are there. And this links me to the um, to your comment on digital activism. And I would say that maybe we should be cautious uh, to label everything as prefigurative, because I think the, the one feature of, pre of prefigurative initiatives is that they're really embodied. They're really, um, there's this kind of materialist 
um, feature. So I'm not sure actually if uh, digital activism could be defined as a type of prefigurative, as prefigurative politics. I, I don't know. And here, here again, goes back to what, how we define prefiguration and what we as scholars decide that is something is prefigurative or not. And it's, there's an open debate, but perhaps, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I'll leave the, the, the floor to her. Um, I'm, I, I don't think I really have anything uh, to add, uh, honestly. Um, but it's really only that, that aspect of prefiguration and teaching. Um, I think that one example I mentioned of a colleague who actually encourages her students to think in terms of actually starting prefigurative projects themselves would be the one thing that comes to mind for me, uh, honestly. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I, I can't think of any specific teaching focus form that, uh, um, unless you're uh, uh, considering things like like teach-ins where you would um, uh, uh, like use teaching or use lectures almost as an as an activist practice itself and kind of do it out in public. Um, I think uh, a friend of uh, uh, Lara uh, uh, and me, uh, Laura Horn, actually does this sort of thing occasionally. She, uh, she's uh, active in um, uh, what's it called? Science Rebellion? Scientists Rebellion? It's it's sort of close to Extinction Rebellion in, in Denmark and um, um, she will sometimes give some of her lectures in public in front of like the, the ministry for for ecology and so on and and that sort of thing uh but i don't know to what extent that uh, that would be considered like a official curriculum let's say but um i think that sort of practice is is definitely yeah prefigurative movement engagement through teaching Maybe one example, if I can <laughs> come in in the discussion is also, I mean, unfortunately it's only for now in Italian, but we, we, we have established a master course, Knowledge in Transition, um, that is very much prefigurative uh, in my opinion, and is mix knowledge from social movement with knowledge from academia. And uh, I think that is very innovative as a, a university program is also interesting because it is an effort made by three different uh, state university that is quite unusual as well that three university collaborates on uh, on establishing a master course of this type and also it is very interesting in, in line with what we were saying because uh, for example the teaching is not uh, uh, inside the university but uh, we select uh, we usually ch ch um, choose a place outside where um, student live together and so also the um, usually academic frontal lecture became convivial lecture somehow and there is a lot of talking and uh, re-elaborating contents learning the le lecture during dinner or lunch and uh, Lara was a teacher uh, a, prof a teacher in this master course last year and uh, now we will be it will be held in Trento this here and uh, Nalice will also be teaching the master and uh, and I think that I don't know Lara what you think uh, as you have experience from outside but I think that it would be an example of how to do prefigurative teaching in uh, universities and um, we were not thinking about, we haven't thought about a mailing list for the set seminar, but Lara has shared a mailing list of alternatives to capitalism that I think that can, rather than to build a new mailing list, I think that we can subscribe that mailing list. And if Lara is agree, um, we can spread and, uh, and share uh, contents and uh, initiatives from, this small group that maybe might be and also in the uh, future. Mm -hmm. on, on radical pedagogy, since so some people might be interested, there is this group, um, it's called Pedagogue, and I put the link there. And it's actually an emanation of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. And it's, um, it's a group of teachers uh, at various levels, and they really reflect on first how to decolonize the curricula and also on how to teach alternatives. So it's also something that could be interesting. Thank you. I have just subscribed. <laughs>
so I don't forget. Um, okay, I think we have passed our mm, time, fin finishing time. Um, so I would leave, uh, I would have many questions, but next time, Lara <laughs> and Bern as well. And uh, so I will leave maybe Roberta Bichetti uh, to close up and just wrap up a, a few reflections on, on our seminars and, um, uh, and the pathway up to here. Um, thank you, Alic. I think uh, when we talked about these uh, seminars, we really did it in spirit of um, prefigurative politics, I think, uh, didn't we, Francesca? This was our idea to have a uh, space where we could talk to each other, but also possibly invite social movement and connect social movement and connect initiatives. So I think uh, this, yeah, this is the spirit where that we um, aligned with when we started this series. And uh, I think this was a really wonderful way of closing this first uh, cycle. So thank you so much, Lara, for your uh, wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Bernd, for your uh, really insightful comments. I hope that this is the beginning and we'll continue these conversations with all the people present uh, today. And thank you also for sharing all the resources. I think they're really useful and it's uh, another way to keep building this research community, which was the first part of Lara's presentation about how, how do we keep building a research community of people that are not just working on these teams, but working in this team with this um, mindset. So um, maybe Francesca, I will leave you the final, final uh, word. Thank you. Just say thanks and uh, see you in uh, October, I, I would say, uh, for another cycle of seminars. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Bern, Roberta, Alice, and all of you. Uh, was very nice, I, I think, a very nice start of this seminar. Thank you so much. Um, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you again. It was very nice also to see you <laughs> virtually, but to see you nonetheless. Bye, Bernd. When you're in Copenhagen, write me. Absolutely. <laughs> see you. Uh, Francesca, I'll stay after yes. the Yes, 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 I'll stay. Beh, stai un attimo Roberta se vuoi un, un secondo uh, salutare o oh, anche Ali, Alice. Stay, I think we can stop the recording. Probably. Ah sì, sorry, mm, I completely forgot. Uh, uh, what should I do? Um, uh, qua.